Oh my god, they're dead! Who could have done such a heinous act? I bet it was that frog down by the swamp. I don't like that frog. He's got them shifty eyes. It was that convict iron jaw, that rapscallion. I bet it was that strange shadowy figure that likes to swing in the park on Thursday nights. I swear to you, it was my stuffed panda. He's, he's possessed. It could have been Ricky's arm. We haven't seen it since it got cut off. I definitely know who the killer is. That that is way. Way. Blank is the killer. Hello and welcome to Blank is the Killer, the unoriginal horror movie podcast where I, your supreme host and magical friend Josh Baker, cover six new-to-me horror movies and, for the last time, babble about Buffy for the seventh topic. This episode, I'll be rambling on about undead STDs, creepy cults, and bloody revenge. Bring along any recently forged weapons as we wander down the road of revenge. Number 1, Night of Something Strange, 2016, directed by Jonathan Strayton. A janitor named Cornelius bangs a corpse in a morgue that is thought to be infected with a strange STD. He then turns into a zombie and forces himself on a female character at his house. A group of high school kids are going on spring break vacation. One of the girls in the group named Carrie goes to the bathroom at a gas station, and even though she tries to hover, her rear makes contact with a toilet seat that Cornelius threw up on right before she showed up. A bunch of people end up getting infected. Two characters, Christine and Dirk, are the only two that make it out alive. They kiss and Christine gets infected. Turns out Dirk is immune. The infection is spreading and Dirk decides to head in its direction to be a hero, only to have his journey prematurely ended when an ambulance runs into him. People infected by the zombie STD and whoever was driving that ambulance are the killers. A ton of insane stuff happens in this movie. Before I jump into it, I want to say that the one thing I think the movie could have gone without is the zombie rape. There are multiple scenes where zombies rape women. It really messes with the comedic tone of the rest of the movie and is completely unnecessary. The movie could have worked perfectly without it. Cornelius could have engaged in consensual sex with the woman at his house, who I'm going to assume is a girlfriend to avoid adding incest to the movie, and there could have been more situations like the toilet seat hover fail instead of the rape. This is a low-budget, incredibly indie production. It's nowhere near perfect and has issues when it comes to sound, gore effects, dialogue, and acting. Even though it has issues, Night of Something Strange is oozing with charm. This movie inspired me to think about making my own horror feature, since even though it's not perfect, it's actually a funny, decently made horror comedy. I just dogged on the dialogue, but it only really suffers when Dirk and Christine are talking together, since their pairing is the only time in the movie that isn't trying to be overly funny. Other than that, there is a ton of hilarious dialogue that, while dumb, I heavily enjoyed. The humor is on point. A lot of the humor is based on absurdity. For example, there is a character named Freddy who is like the jerky clown character. He keeps making fun of a huskier character named Jason. I will say that the fat jokes sucked and weren't original or needed, but I think the absurdity of the part I'm about to unveil is fantastic. Freddy is trying to bang Carrie, who turns him away. He leaves the motel room they were both in and Jason enters a little later. By the time Jason enters, Carrie has started becoming a zombie. She asks Jason to bang her as hard as he can, and he obliges. Freddy comes back to the room and finds a naked body in the dark. It's obviously Jason, but he thinks it's Carrie. He asks if she's down for doing it, and gets a moan in response, which Freddy takes as a green light. After trying to get things started and finding there to be too much friction, Freddy starts going down on Jason and eventually bangs him all without realizing it's Jason. It's absolutely absurd and the way it's done is hilarious. Freddy also gets his willy stuck in Jason's bum, which leads to even more hilarious shenanigans. This movie attempts to mostly use practical gore. There is a lot of animated blood splatter whenever a gun is used, but besides that, I do respect the practical gore attempts even though there are some that look pretty terrible. The two worst gore effects in the movie are shown back to back, which really makes you notice them. 
During Carrie and Jason's bone session, Carrie bites off one of Jason's nipples, quickly followed by also removing his lip in the same toothy manner. Both the nipple and lip removal do not sell at all. Luckily, these aren't the only effects. There are monster, penis, and vagina effects that are amazing. I'm not 100% sure how they did the monster vagina that basically turns into a mouth with teeth that shoots out a giant tentacle, but from the looks of it, most of the budget must have gone to this effect. It's truly amazing for such an independent film. There are some iffy makeup effects like Cornelius' face after he's hit by a car. The wounds don't make much sense. I still enjoyed his look to some extent, and I like the makeup for the gas station worker that transformed the younger woman who plays the character into an older looking lady. The makeup's fun. The movie had a hell of a time trying to get a makeup effects artist. One quit before the movie and another was fired after shooting started. There are some physical actions that aren't believable at all in the film. Freddy punches Jason in the stomach and Christine trips. Both of these actions are obviously faked and faked poorly. If I'm acting in a movie like this, I don't mind getting punched in the stomach or doing a real trip. You can do a light stomach punch and still capture something that looks like a real one, and you're probably not going to get hurt doing a quick trip. These scenes don't end up ruining the movie, but definitely take you out of it. I said the acting wasn't great, and that's definitely true. Thing is, the acting makes the movie better in all scenes, barring the ones where Christine and Dirk are talking to each other. The over-the-top, campy acting really heightens all of the humorous dialogue. While there are a ton of sound issues, like an entire conversation that's obviously dubbed over, I really like the soundtrack. I'm pretty sure original songs were recorded for this. When Dirk is introduced initially as the bad boy character, his car is blaring a country blues song that starts with the line about waking up and kicking your dog. If you can look past some zombie rape scenes and don't mind a ton of gross-out humor, I definitely recommend checking out Night of Something Strange. I found it to be stupid funny and surprisingly inspiring. Fun fact, all the character names reference horror icons. I found that a little cheesy to be honest, but hey, it doesn't alter my opinion of the movie. One last thing I didn't love about this movie is a sequence where Dirk fantasizes about killing his cheating girlfriend. It's done in a way where you don't know it's fake until we rewind after it's shown. I think the only time something like this has worked was in Superbad when Jonah Hill gets his throat slashed in the liquor store. Number 2, Mother, 2017, directed by Darren Aronofsky. No one actually has names in this, so here we go. J-Law, credited as Mother, is rebuilding Bardem's, credited as Him's, house after it burned down. He's a poet with a bad case of writer's block. He also has a glass crystal from the burned remnants of the fire that's really important to him. A random fan who's dying shows up. The fan's wife shows up, and the couple breaks the crystal. Their sons also make it to the house. One of the sons murders the other over inheritance issues. This event leads J-Law to finding a secret passage in the basement that contains an oil tank. The randos have a funeral at the house and are jerks to J-Law. They destroy stuff and are cast out. J-Law is mad at Bartom for allowing all this home invasion to happen without her consent. They have sex and she gets pregnant. Bartom writes a new, dope poem. More crazy fans and Bartom's publicist, credited as Harold, storm the house. There is random chaos that can't be real. People die. J-Law has her baby. The fans end up killing and eating it. J-Law goes to the secret passage in the basement where an oil tank is located and blows up the house. Bardem takes out her heart that has a new glass crystal in it and starts the cycle over with another girl. The oldest son, the publicist, or er, Harold, and Bardem's crazed fans are the killers. You can say that this movie is an allegory for Mother Earth versus man, and that J-Law is Mother Earth, Bardem is God, and the fans are the human race? Cool. That doesn't change the fact that I think this movie is stupid and a waste of time. It's the Bible. J-Law is still Earth. Bartim is still God, the fan that shows up first is Adam, his wife is Eve, the crystal is the apple, the sons are Cain and Abel, yada yada. I want to say I have enjoyed all of the films I've seen from Aronofsky up to viewing Mother. I liked Requiem for a Dream, The Wrestler, and Black Swan. Mother is just a nonsensical adaptation of the Bible. It's boring. If your defense of a garbage plot is, it's a metaphor, look at all the symbolism, I don't care. The human population is ruining the planet. Well, yeah, you don't need to make a heavy-handed movie about it. 
Barring the plot, this is a very well-made film. There's great cinematography, I enjoyed Jennifer Lawrence's performance, the sound design is great, and I was enthralled by Mother's strange sickness that seemed to make her more sensitive to sounds. Before the film goes completely off the rails, it captures the feeling of anxiety perfectly. I enjoyed the film up until the point where Bardem gets a call from his publisher. I'd say that is the turning point where a promising premise is destroyed. After he answers the phone, we basically shift from something that could actually be happening to a nonsensical dream world. Well, more of a nightmare world, I suppose, since I'd say the movie is basically J-Law having a nightmare. There are interesting ideas strewn throughout the second half of the film. I did like the idea of a strange cult forming from fans of him, which I assume are supposed to represent zealots and the crusades. I actually would have preferred that the movie stayed in the realm of reality and showed a passage of time where these events happen instead of having them all happen at once in a fever dream-like fashion. When reality is thrown out the window in Mother, I no longer empathize with what I'm seeing on screen and due to this, I'm not affected by things such as dead baby cannibalism. I feel that there was a lot of misinformation surrounding the film around its release. From what I had heard, I expected there to be some intense instances of body horror. There isn't really any body horror. I mean, unless you want to count the baby, you see the butchered body of the baby, but without the context of the film, what is shown could literally be anything. The carcass is flashed on screen briefly and isn't nearly as disturbing as a recent lingering shot of a head that I'm assuming most of you have seen by now. I want to say a lot of my disenjoyment of the film comes from wrongly set expectations. What I wanted was an anxiety-fueled horror movie set in the realm of reality and instead got a fever dream with ham-fisted symbolism. Bardom and J-Law are never believable as a couple either. Not that that really matters, I suppose. The relationship is supposed to feel one-sided, so the distance between them technically works. If you want a surreal movie that borrows heavily from the Bible, maybe think about watching Mother. I personally don't recommend it, and think you can get more bang for your time elsewhere. Final thing to mention, J-Law ends up killing some people after they murder and eat her baby. I'm counting that as revenge, obviously, so she's not on the killer list. I didn't forget about her. Number 3, Last Shift, 2014, directed by Anthony de Blasi. A rookie cop named Jessica Lawrence starts her first shift at an abandoned police station that's about to be completely closed. She's waiting for a hazmat team to show up and take away some old evidence. During her shift, paranormal activity starts happening. Lauren is told how her father was killed by the Payman family cult by the ghost of his partner. She also finds out that the Payman cultists and their leader weren't killed on scene at their farm. They were taken alive to the police station where Lauren is. The leader and his two followers hung themselves after completing some type of hell ritual. After learning all this, Lauren sees the demonic ghosts of the three that died. She then believes surviving members of the cult are infiltrating the station. She kills all of them before being shot by another police officer. The people Lauren killed were the hazmat workers. Jessica Lauren and the Payman family are the killers. First off, that's Payman family as in followers of a guy in the movie named John Michael Payman. P-A-Y-M-O-N. His last name is spelled differently than the other Payman, P-A-I-M-O-N, one of the kings of hell. The Payman family are also worshippers of the king of hell Payman. I'm not sure why they spelled the guy's last name differently. Besides Hereditary, this is the only other movie I've seen where Payman is the one being worshipped. I really enjoy the use of other demonic figures besides Satan. I'd like to see more movies bring lesser known evils to light. If you have any recommendations for movies that showcase other ancient evils, let me know. Back to Last Shift. This is a low budget movie that I didn't particularly love, but it is an entertaining enough ride. I'd say my biggest issue with the movie is the main character, Jessica Lauren. This movie revolves around her first shift as a police officer. She's given the department's Charlie work and has to watch over this old abandoned station. Her actions in the beginning make sense. When there's just a little weirdness here or there, I understand brushing it off as odd, non-supernatural occurrences. Things are moving. This is a graveyard shift. I'm probably just tired. 
Now when it comes to multiple TVs turning on and showing cultist interviews, multiple chairs rolling into me with no one in sight, and getting locked in a cell with something I can't see that's mocking me, you better believe I'm either getting out of there completely or at the very least calling the other station to report these happenings, no matter how crazy I sound. No job is worth putting up with those red flags. Lauren just puts up with most of this and goes back to her desk. There's one point where she calls her supervisor, but instead of telling him a full-fledged demonic haunting is happening, she hesitates and leaves a message gushing about being a cop. Lauren, if I was that supervisor, I'd be way more pissed off if I received a pointless voicemail compared to one about some spooky goings-on. There are so many instances in Last Shift where Lauren doesn't do anything a normal person with half a brain would do. I mean, maybe she has a history of schizophrenia or something and thinks she's just imagining all this insanity, but nothing in the movie reveals that assumption to be true. At one point in the movie, she looks into the room where all the chairs were violently rolled at her. She looks away for a literal second, looks back in the room, and sees all the chairs stacked in a crazy formation. After seeing this, Lauren assumes some other cops are pulling a prank on her. Lauren, even if it was a mess with the rookie prank, it would be literally impossible for anyone to stack the chairs that quickly. Literally impossible for anyone with a pulse, or lack of demonic powers that is. After Lauren thinks it's a prank, a cop shows up to check on her. He's obviously a ghost. Lauren doesn't realize this, and instead of telling the ghost cop about the disturbing events that have been happening, Lauren plays it cool. Even after she finds out he's a ghost, she still plays it cool. This doesn't come off as her being brave or anything, it comes off as her being a big dum-dum. Eventually, Lauren calls her supervisor again, gets him on the phone, and terribly explains things to him. He's grumpy about receiving a call, as we all would be during our time off, but Lauren doesn't even try to win him over by fully explaining the severity of the situation she's in. Even though her actions aren't realistic at all, the acting during her unrealistic approach to the haunting isn't good. Anyone in that situation should be showing genuine terror. I don't care if you're the most courageous, bravest person in the world. You're going to be spooked after what Lauren witnesses. The rest of the acting in the movie is also bad. The worst offender being a prostitute that Lauren talks to outside the station, who is only there to provide exposition regarding the cult. The prostitute says she feels safer by the old police department, but then goes on to say she saw some truly horrific things regarding the cult there, which shakes her up. I don't think I'd feel safer near a place where a cult ritualistically committed suicide. There isn't a lot of gore in this movie. Most gore comes from gunshots. The gunshots look fine. There are some well-done makeup effects that pop up when John Michael Payman shows his demonic final form. His face in this form is heavily used in the advertising for this movie, and he only shows this form in the last 20 minutes. An actual cultist makes it into the police station and kills herself in front of Lauren, which makes the ending twist work. Without the real cultist showing up, I think it would have been obvious that Lauren ends up killing the hazmat crew. Last Shift has a neat enough location and premise, but doesn't do enough with the crazy demonic cult to make it worth a watch. It's an alright low budget horror movie, but you'd be better off watching something else. Number 4, Slice, 2018, directed by Austin Vesely. In a town divided into two parts, one for the living and one for ghosts, Pizza delivery people are being murdered. Everyone thinks it's a werewolf that has come back to town. Witches are behind the killing. They were trying to get everyone away from the pizza place so that they could use a portal to hell in its basement. The portal is opened, the werewolf fights the witches, and everything ends when the police shoot and kill the lead witch. The witches are the killers. Don't watch this movie. Yeah, I'm going to start off that bluntly. When I first heard that A24 was going to distribute a horror comedy based around a pizza place, I was hype. Given A24's track record, why wouldn't I be? Out of nowhere, the movie was released straight to video on demand. Now, I'm not a stupid idiot. I knew that the Hush Hush release and Theater Dodge meant the movie was going to be garbage, but some of the most enjoyable horror films are terrible. Slice is just terrible. I think the only times I wasn't bored to death were when Chris Parnell was on screen, and that's just because I think Chris Parnell is inherently amusing. Why did so many people sign on to this movie? 
Did they not read the script? This is a horror comedy with no horror or comedy. As I watched it, I'd hear dialogue that the writer-director Austin Vesely, who also plays the character Sean, must have thought would make me laugh, but all the dialogue and its abysmal delivery put me further and further into a state of complete uninterest. I wanted the movie to be over as quickly as possible. It's only about an hour and 20 minutes, but it feels like a three-hour movie due to nothing entertaining happening throughout Slice's entire runtime. Slice actually comes off as a three-episode pitch for a crappy TV show. There's a journalist that provides a bunch of pointless exposition after every third of the movie, which makes it feel like you're watching three bland episodes of a show instead of a movie. There's a huge trend going on right now where all movies are trying to capture an 80s vibe. I keep hearing people talk about movies being throwbacks to the 80s, but most of the time that just means the movie has a bunch of neon colors and synths. Having neon colors and synths doesn't make your movie an 80s throwback. Slice is all style and no substance. Even though I'm almost 100% over the new Stranger Things aesthetic trend, the costume designs and locations in this aren't bad. The cinematography is boring and simplistic. None of the shots in this impressed me. The acting is some of the worst I've ever seen. Zazie Beetz is the only one that isn't hamming it up for no reason. Paul Shear plays Paul Shear, which is sadly better than pretty much all of the other acting in this. To be fair, Chris Parnell also plays himself, but I have loved him since seeing him in Hot Rod. Slice has a cop duo trying to figure out who's murdering the pizza workers. I've realized that cop duos are normally a huge waste of time in horror movies. I can't point at a cop duo that adds to a horror movie off the top of my head. In Slice, the cops are terribly unfunny and instead plain annoying. The ghosts in this movie have some mediocre makeup applied to them. I assume that they originally wanted to go full translucent ghosts, but didn't have the budget for it. I'm glad they didn't have a big enough budget since this dumpster stew of a film shouldn't have even been greenlit. The kills in this are boring. We get multiple throat slashes, which are all done in the same way. Zazie gets stabbed in the back, and a witch gets shot in the head. Paul Shear blows himself up. The gore and makeup effects for them are fine, but the deaths are so lame and simplistic that it would have been hard to mess them up. The best thing about Slice is the opening credit sequence. Besides that, the only other moments that were any fun at all were the two scenes where characters realize they're dead. Completely avoid Slice. Watch Splice instead, which is what I kept saying to people whenever I tried to bring up Slice. If you see the name Austin Vesely on display, it's probably best to stay away. Number 5, Mandy, 2018, directed by Panos Cosmatos. A girl named Mandy is kidnapped by a cult led by a guy named Jeremiah Sand, with a little help from a biker gang. Red, the man Mandy is in love with, is also captured. Mandy isn't down with the cult, so they burn her alive in front of Red. Red escapes and exacts revenge on the bikers and cult. The Jeremiah Sand cult and gang of pain-loving bikers are the killers. The hype surrounding this movie engulfed me as if it were lava erupting out of a volcano while I was hanging around the rim. I wish I hadn't allowed myself to be hyped up to such a dangerous degree. Right now, you might be thinking, uh-oh, I've heard this movie is incredible. Why is Josh starting off like this instead of saying it's an amazing movie right off the bat? Alright, back off everyone. Give me a second to explain. Mandy is a unique cinematic experience with incredible cinematography and a spectacular original soundtrack that has some major pacing issues. If this movie was 20 to 30 minutes shorter, I think I would be Paul revering its name through the streets. Thing is, the pacing makes this movie drag in multiple places, and when it drags, it drags hard. There you have it. My big gripe that is holding me back from completely loving this movie is the pacing. Don't fret though, I still recommend checking out Mandy, especially in theater if possible. I feel that Mandy is more of an experience than your average movie. I'd equate it to Harmony Korine's Spring Breakers. When both films ended, I wasn't sure how I felt about them, but with Mandy and Spring Breakers, the more time they marinate in my mind, the more I appreciate the cinematic experience I had while watching them. I haven't seen Spring Breakers in years, 
but vividly remember the sequence that has Britney Spears' every time playing over that robbery. Mandy perfectly captures an old fantasy novel. I watched it at the Alamo Draft House and caught the entire pre-show, which showed clips from Hellraiser, Heavy Metal, and different fantasy movies. You can see the influence those films had on Mandy. The acting in this movie is amazing. Linus Roach's performance as the cult leader, Jeremiah Sand, is impeccable. Andrea Riseborough makes Mandy such a simple yet believable character. Well, I think everyone but Nicolas Cage is amazing. Cage has basically ascended from regular actor status and transformed into this crazy energy that we as viewers have come to expect and crave when watching a film with Cage in it. Nicolas Cage is basically a self-actualized meme. I think the word meme basically has no meaning nowadays, but honestly, I think Nicolas Cage and meme go hand in hand at this point. Mandy's score was one of the last scores done by Johan Johansson before he passed away. Other films that I've seen that he scored include Sicario, Arrival, and Blade Runner 2049. His scores have been incredible, and it's a shame that he's gone. I think the entire reason Sicario is such an enthralling experience is his score. Johansson's score for Mandy is an actual throwback to the 80s. I know in current times that normally means the soundtrack is synthy. I just complained about it when talking about Slice. To be fair, Johansson used a lot of synths in Mandy, but more importantly, he harnessed the power of hard rock. When I think of old 80s movies that I love, a large percentage of them had cheesy, hard rock encoded into the soundtrack. That's what I associate with 80s soundtracks. Johansson perfectly harnessed a combination of synth and hard rock jams to make Mandy come alive. The droning guitars throughout the movie make you really feel like what you're watching is some alien fantasy world. The cinematography and lighting make sure you believe you're witnessing a fantastical adventure. The composition of shots in Mandy are powerful and thought out. Do some of these shots linger for a bit too long? Well, yeah, but luckily they're beautiful, even though some do drag on longer than I would personally like. I'm not against dwelling on shots. There is a very long single shot of a close-up of Jeremiah's face as he tries his damnedest to indoctrinate Mary. Throughout his incoherent cult leader monologue, his face shifts to and from Mandy's. It's disorienting and amazing. I can't get over how perfect Roach plays this mightier-than-thou vain monster. The other members in the cult also do a great job, but most of them don't get nearly as much screen time. There are two different parts in the movie where fantasy items are revealed. They are shown with a close-up shot of the item and a green strobe light flashes as we're told about them. These are the Horn of Abraxas and the Tainted Blade of the Pale Knight. I loved how these items are shown as if they are some incredibly powerful fantasy items. I do wish that more was done with the Tainted Blade of the Pale Knight. It's used to give Cage a quick gut poke, but never comes up again. The Horn of Abraxas summons the gang of Cenobite bikers. Well, they aren't actually Cenobites, but it's obvious that this gang of dastardly non-demons are based on them. Their designs totally work. The Cenobite look hasn't gotten stale in my opinion. The trailer makes them come off as actual demons, but we get some unnecessary exposition from a friend of Cage's character that lets us know they're just a crew of individuals that were driven crazy after having a run-in with an especially bad batch of acid, which ended up turning them into murderous, pain-loving monsters. The exposition is pretty pointless, since we really don't need the origin story for the biker gang. The film would have worked better without it. I get that Cage needed to find them though, so the friend should have just told him where the gang was seen versus that information regarding their origins, which is a strange thing for this random friend character to know. The biker gang is more interesting when they are shrouded in mystery. I wanted to believe they could actually be demons. Mandy does have some genuine laughs in it, most stem from Cage's perfect Nicolas Cage performance, but there are other moments that aren't solely based around him, my favorite being the commercial featuring Cheddar Goblin. I don't want to completely spoil it, 
So basically, once Cage gets back to his house after witnessing the woman he loves, which honestly, this is one of the most believable representations of a couple in love I have ever seen on screen, it's awesome that their chemistry feels real. Hollywood normally would get a ridiculously attractive woman in her 20s to play the love interest, which never works. Cage comes home right after seeing Mandy burned alive, which is probably one of the darkest things you can witness, and then we are instantly hit with the juxtaposition of this absurd Cheddar Goblin commercial. It's great. Cheddar Goblin was created by the same people that brought us Too Many Cooks. Make sure to check that out if you haven't. The entire design for Mandy is fantastic. I especially love the style of the opening credits and the three title cards throughout the film. Pet warning, we linger on a shot of a recently killed fawn that I think is unnecessary but not horrifying. Due to my love of the Evil Dead series and my knowledge that Mandy is a horror film, the entire time the fawn was on screen, I was waiting for it to creepily come back to life. It doesn't. The gore in Mandy, once Cage gets going on his revenge rampage, is well done and practical. There's a part where he decapitates a character that's on fire. He then picks up a cigarette and bends over to light it on the still flaming head. I feel like this was a completely missed opportunity to make a way more badass scene. Cage chops the head off with a ridiculous fantasy sci-fi inspired battle axe which Cosmatos, the director, said is based on the F in the metal band Celtic Frost logo, the axe has spiked edges on the top and bottom. Cage should have put the cigarette in his mouth, stabbed the flaming head with his gaudy weapon, and brought the flaming head up to the cigarette instead of bending over to light it. That would have been the perfect visual representation of badassity. Now, would Mandy work with anyone besides Nicolas Cage as Red? At first, I thought it wouldn't work. But I have to say, with the right performance, I think others would work. Nicolas Cage's performances are what draws some types of people to movies that they wouldn't give the time of day otherwise. So in order to make this movie as popular as it's becoming, it's possible Cage is irreplaceable here. Mandy is a cinematic experience that has some gnarly pacing issues. I highly recommend checking this out in a theater if possible. If you are someone that absolutely despises slower, artsy movies, this isn't for you, and that's okay. I personally didn't absolutely love it, even though I think it's worth seeing. This isn't solely a Cage Revenge Rampage movie. Number 6, Revenge, 2017. Directed by Coralie Farja. A girl named Jen and a guy named Richard show up at a house Richard has in the middle of nowhere. Jen is Richard's mistress. Two of Richard's friends, Stan and Dimitri, show up to the house earlier than expected. While Richard is away, Stan forces himself on Jen and Dimitri, who knows what's going on, does nothing. Richard gets back and tries to throw money at Jen to make the problem go away. Jen runs from the house and is chased by the men. She ends up at the edge of a cliff. Richard pushes her off and she is impaled on a tree. The men leave her for dead. Jen survives and picks off the men one by one. No one is the killer. Technically, Richard, Stan, and Dimitri are the attempted murderers. Jen is exacting her very just revenge, so she's obviously not being labeled as a killer. Rape Revenge is a genre that has been around forever. It's not a genre I seek out. I haven't seen Last House on the Left or I Spit on Your Grave. I don't really want to. I guess some people find it cathartic when the victim takes their revenge. You can have a different catalyst for a woman to seek revenge. One of my favorite revenge films is John Wick. He's set off by his dog being killed. You could have had a very similar movie to Revenge where Jen has a boyfriend who is killed by the three guys where she's then left for dead in the same way without the rape. I decided to give Revenge a shot since it's directed by a woman. Does it bring anything interesting to the genre? Nope. Watching the comeuppance of the garbage trio is enjoyable, but it would have been just as enjoyable with a different catalyst. The acting in this is not great. None of these people feel real. The delivery is awful. 
It's especially awful when it's in English. The three guys mostly speak French. The main draw for this movie are the gruesome deaths of the terrible characters. So how are those? Well, they're alright. The gore is done practically and there is a ton of blood in this movie. I swear, the idea of someone dying from blood loss alone is not a thing in this movie. Everyone but Dimitri loses a ton of blood before either surviving or being shot to death. Dimitri's face catches the sharp end of a knife multiple times, making him the first death. This looks good and I really like the effects done for his bloated, disgusting corpse that ends up being found by the other two guys. Stan the Rapist doesn't get as much torture as you'd expect, but gets shot in the shoulder which leads to him taking off a shoe so he can use his sock as a terrible bandage. Since he's now barefoot, we get an incredibly yeesh inducing sequence where Jen smashes a flashlight which leaves glass on the ground, Stan pursues her, and ends up with, you guessed it, a huge shard of glass in his foot. He picks it out with his fingers and boy oh boy is this all done practically and incredibly grotesque. This still doesn't dethrone the current Yeesh King which is still that scene from Gerald's game. Stan's glass foot does have a certain cartoonish feel to it since it ends up being pretty over the top. He even uses that foot to hit the gas pedal when he gets back to the trio's car which doesn't make any sense. I would use my uninjured foot but hey. More blood gushes out of the wound if he smashes that foot down on the pedal. Jen kills him with a headshot. Richard's death is the bloodiest of the bunch. He's naked back at the house when Jen shows up and shoots him in the torso. After this, Jen and Richard start running around the house like Tom and Jerry as Richard bleeds all over everything. There is so much fake blood in this sequence and it all looks great. I knew someone had to slip and fall since the floor ends up completely covered. Jen does fall, and the fall feels legit. Jen ends up ending Richard with the second shot, and that's all the revenge kills. Throughout the movie, Jen is wearing these huge neon star earrings. Stan starts shooting at her as he's chasing her, and one of Jen's earlobes is shot off. I thought her losing an earring from the shot looked kinda cool. Jen has a branch in her abdomen, which we get to see removed in a ridiculous peyote taking beer can cauterization scene. None of what happens during this self-surgery is anywhere near realistic, but Jen comes off as a total badass. She ends up with this awesome looking brand from the beer can logo over her wound. I know there's no way the can would leave that brand, but it does look rad. The gore is the best thing about this movie. It's all done incredibly well. Is it enough to earn this movie a recommendation? Of course not. Overall, this is an uninspired rape revenge movie. Pass on revenge. If you really want to watch a rape revenge movie for some reason, check out Belladonna of Sadness. It's a beautiful hand-drawn film from 1973 where a wronged woman turns into a powerful witch. Number 7, Buffy Babble, The Final Babbling. I have now watched all seasons of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. That's four days and nine hours of Scooby Gang antics, folks. Reflecting back on my watch, it was worth it. Buffy the Vampire Slayer has its ups and downs, but overall, I really enjoyed my time watching this show. Here is the final killer list. Caleb. The First One's Bringers. Turok Hans, aka Uber Vamps, and a bomb are the killers. Caleb is this rando preacher that shows up out of nowhere. He's played by Nathan Fillion and is basically thrown into the story to be a fightable entity of the first. The first makes him super strong. It's dumb. I don't like Nathan Fillion. I know that practically everyone else does, but I think he's a terrible actor. This series finale feels incredibly rushed. The second to last episode, End of Days, is a real head scratcher. Okay, so this really lame preacher character comes out of nowhere, that's fine I guess. Buffy ends up getting a powerful battle axe at the place the preacher is hanging out. This is a little strange, but works. I'm not sure why they keep calling the battle axe a scythe. Have any of these people ever seen a scythe? Remember Buffy's other mystical weapon? That sword that could capture souls? She probably should have kept that instead of breaking it. Anyway, Buffy has this special battle axe. 
She then randomly pops up at some sort of pyramid-shaped tomb in Sunnydale that we've never seen before. The tomb is sealed, so Buffy kicks in what would be a doorway. Inside, she meets a random old lady who's been in the tomb for God knows how long that doesn't really have any reason to exist besides telling Buffy she helped make this magical axe. The lady then gets her neck snapped by Caleb. Wait, what? Where the hell did Caleb come from? The tomb was sealed before Buffy got there. How did he get in unnoticed? Uh, whatever. Buffy fights Caleb and Angel shows up for a second to help. They kiss, which Spike, who is somehow also hiding in the tomb, sees. The first then uses the Angel makeout sesh to goad Spike into thinking Buffy is being a bee. Buffy kills Caleb and tells Angel he needs to leave in case a second front is needed to beat the first. Buffy then meets up with Spike, whom is like, Dude, I thought we were kind of a thing. And Buffy's like, well, kind of that kiss was like nothing, my man. And Spike's like, alright, cool, let me wear this amulet that Angel gave you, which is said to be quite volatile. Spike then goes on to help in the final big battle without hesitation. Why the hell did we have the first show Spike the kissing, when there shouldn't have been any way for him to sneak into the tomb, if nothing is going to happen because of it? This whole tomb sequence is incredibly out of place and pointless. I digress. On to other issues with the finale. We learn that there are a gazillion uber vamps under Sunnydale High School, so Buffy comes up with a plan to defeat them. She's going to have Willow do a spell with the Mystic Battle Axe, which will give all potential slayers full slayer powers. Then all the slayers are going to fight the uber vamps, while Spike wears his amulet, which will hopefully do something while the slayers are doing their thing down below the normies are going to defend some exits in case any uber vamps try to escape okay well if you're going to have the normies fight multiple uber vamps when one is probably enough to kill almost all of them why don't you break holes in the walls and ceilings of those areas so the normies are protected by sunlight it doesn't technically end up mattering but it seems like something like that should have been included in the plan. The battle starts, the slayers all get power, they kill a bunch of uber vamps, there's at least one potential slayer killed, some uber vamps make it to the normies, some bringers also show up, one of the bringers cuts Anya almost completely in half with a dagger. Seriously, the dagger cuts through her like she's made of butter. Anya dies, which sucks. But the sun thing I talked about wouldn't have stopped the bringers, so at least she isn't killed by an uber vamp for absolutely no reason. Spike turns into a sun conduit. He ends up double dead as he's vaporized by the power which takes out a ton of uber vamps. The entire town of Sunnydale then begins to collapse as everyone who's still alive leaves Sunnydale in and on a school bus. That's the ending. Sunnydale is completely destroyed and the world is saved from an apocalypse once again. Oh, the entire population of Sunnydale had evacuated the city beforehand. That's the series finale. It's not anywhere near a great finale, but it's passable. I mean, I watched all of Dexter, so my bar for series finales is pretty low. I do think the ending of season 5 would have been the better series finale though. Buffy sacrificing herself is much more impactful, in my opinion, than an empty Sunnydale being completely destroyed. Anya is one of my favorite characters, and her death does feel a little cheap. I guess killing Buffy again would have also felt cheap. Now that I've seen all of Buffy, I can confirm that the mayor is the best big bad, closely followed by Willow. Willow might have won the title if the writing in that season wasn't so terrible. The worst characters are Riley, Angel, and Andrew, who bring nothing exciting to the table and only hinder my enjoyment of the show. Xander ends up being alright. The best characters are Willow, Oz, Jonathan, Kulak, Spike, Drusilla, Anya, and the Mayor. That's all folks. If you've never watched Buffy and want a long running show to binge, I recommend checking it out. I'll cover the movie that started it all next episode. There you have it, an end to the babble along with some great and terrible movies this episode. I'm going to miss doing the Buffy babble section, hopefully I'll find a suitable replacement. 
If you like this episode of Blank is the Killer, why not give it a rating on iTunes? If you aren't feeling that, you can interact with me on Instagram using the hashtag blank is the killer. I'd love some wacky recommendations. As always, a thanks to Sticker Fridge for hosting the podcast. If you're looking for more podcasts, there are a bunch on the Sticker Fridge network. Episode 29 will be out on October 7th. Look out for something spooky from Blank is the Killer on October 1st.